Amen. Well, uh, as you remember from last week, the plan today is to sort of have a um, catch-all. Um, we have the opportunity to have an extra week here to focus on the doctrine of the church, the category we're in. Um, so I have some good news and bad news. Um, the bad news, I guess, is that hardly anybody sent me any questions. The good news is um, Robin did, but her questions really weren't in the topic of the church, as I was hoping. Um, Robin, I'll get you to, I'll get to your questions if we don't get to, to them today. Um, but um, I do want to focus on our current section of the church. And so if you have your notebooks with you and can turn to page 208, um, there's one or two of the interpretation or application questions in the various lessons in this section that we didn't spend much time on when we were going through these lessons. And so I thought I'd circle back and uh, touch on them, see uh, to what extent we've got discussion on uh, any of those things. So on page 208, uh, it's the homework for lesson 30. The second interpretation question says, discuss the biblical evidence that the church is distinct from Israel. That is, that the promises made to Israel will be fulfilled to Israel and not by the church. So, um, and most of you are probably aware that there are <clears throat> uh, large uh, denominations, traditions um, that uh, are convinced that the church has replaced Israel. Uh, and, and that actually has lots of implications if it were true but we don't believe that is true. And so the point of this question is to think through what evidence we have in scripture that uh, the church has not replaced Israel, but God still has a plan for Israel. So, um, how do you, Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was trying to figure out how I hit unmute before I figured out how to raise my hand. So, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, for me, it's Romans 1.16. Um, that, uh, that, that the, the verse uh, says uh, uh, it, it's for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also the Greek. So Paul immediately makes a distinction um, uh, between the Jew and the Greek, and also that term first in Greek is one of priority, right? So that there is a definite idea that there is a distinction there. And then also, um, it, it's kind of would be strange that 144,000 Jews would be saved uh, in the tribulation if they were not also distinct. And so, and also that moment that the 144,000 are saved is a distinct moment in the tribulation period where God then at that moment uh, begins to take actions and, and um, uh, protect Israel and also at the same time pour out his wrath on, on the world. The uh, arguments that people hold that the church has replaced Israel, all the arguments they have, or how they would deal with that passage in, in Romans 1, 
But I could imagine they would say that the first there is not so much priority, but chronology. That the uh, Christianity came first to the Jews. It came through the Jews. The first Christians were Jews. And then over time, it expanded, as Christ said it would, to um, Samaria um, and uh, the Gentiles, the remotest part of the earth. Um, so, well, from our perspective, we can see um, um, the distinctness of Israel and, and the church. They might not view that verse that same way. Uh, the Revelation one, though, uh, where 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel are saved during the tribulation period, um, that's a little bit more persuasive, I think. Um, but any other, um, any other thoughts, Sean? Um, <clears throat> Kind of continuing with the theme in, in Revelation, you go to Revelation 21 uh, verses, what is it, 12, 12 to 14. Um, there is the distinction even there between the 12 tribes of Israel and, and representation of the 12 apostles um, uh, with that. And, and that's where, you know, I, I go to with respect to Revelation. There is a distinction with how God, you know, treated the church, which before Revelation, you know, we're talking about the rapture and all, and what goes on with, you know, with Israel or, or uh, you know, throughout, you know, the rest of that time. So I think, you know, even here, there is the distinguishing. He doesn't put the two together in that section of verses. They are distinct. Yes. Yeah. Um. Perhaps a bit more fundamental, uh, and, and uh, something that's that's I think more difficult for um, our um, our our brethren. Let's say I mean we're, we're talking about genuine believers who are convinced, even from Scripture, they think that uh, it, the church has replaced Israel. Um, but um, I go back to um, the Abrahamic covenant, in, which has actually developed multiple sta stages in uh, the early books of Genesis. But particularly in Genesis 15, where God is very specific about the promises he's making to Abraham, um, those promises are not conditional. They are unconditional. And there's uh, three parts to that covenant, that promise that God's making. God promised to um, bless Abraham and bless those who bless him. He promised... Um, uh, descendants who could not be numbered. Uh, and he promised the land that would be his forever, the promised land. Uh, now, people could argue that that blessing has been accomplished and that the, um, the descendants have been accomplished. But um, Israel, even though they've come back to the land, they don't occupy the, the extent of the land that God promised, very specifically. Um, and um, you could spiritualize that, which those who hold this replacement theology uh, hold, you can spiritualize that saying, well, you know, that was, that's being fulfilled by the church. But um, God didn't say, I will do this for you if. It's unconditional. He says, I will do this. 
And elsewhere, he actually says, I have given you this land, even though he didn't, at the time, experience that. Um, likewise, the Davidic covenant is unconditional. Uh, the covenant that is conditional is the Mosaic covenant, the law. Uh, if you obey, I will bless you. If you don't, I will curse you very explicitly. But that's not true of the Abrahamic covenant. And Paul makes a point of that in Galatians, that um, the coming of the law didn't uh, abrogate, didn't uh, supersede the um, Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant is one of promise, unconditional promise. It's um, not by works, it's by God's declaration. And uh, Paul used that as a, as a basis, but also an example of God's unconditional uh, salvation that he offered. Um, so that's, in my view, a very fundamental thing that is a difference between um, our view of, of scripture and um, this covenantal slash replacement theology um, perspective. Um, I would go so far as to say I don't see any specific scriptural reference to the fact that the church does replace Israel. So I would go the other way. I want to see some evidence that it that there that separation theology is correct, and I haven't seen that yet. Yes, you have to read into various texts with a presumption of replacement in order to make them say what you want them to say. And that's that's a danger that we all need to be on guard against, to try to twist the scriptures to fit our preconceived ideas rather than let the scriptures speak for themselves. Yeah. Pastor Plumley, do, do you have offhand have the scripture reference in Galatians that you were referencing? Yeah, well, I could find it, probably. Um, I would start looking around chapter three. Are you talking, talking about the end of chapter three? Uh, that is related. Were you talking about chapter uh, verse 15, where no covenants annulled? Yes, that's the one. Uh, it's more specific than that, though, elsewhere. Seventeen says uh, about the Abrahamic covenant. Yes, that's it. Seventeen. I went right by it because I have some text uh, highlighted here and I missed it. So he says, starting in sixteen, uh, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds, referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. And verse 17, what I'm saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, after the Abrahamic covenant, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. So the promise to Abraham is fixed, and the law comes in after that, not to replace it, but to serve its own purpose. In fact, he says in, in verse um, 19, well, why the law then? Well, it was added because of transgressions 
having been ordained through the angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Uh, and he talks elsewhere about the law being like a tutor and, and so on. But uh, the point is verse 17, that the law, the Mosaic covenant, which obviously Israel did not obey, and so they reaped the curses that God had promised, um, it did not replace the Abrahamic covenant, which is continued, and it's actually fulfilled in Christ. Uh, but we'll, we'll also, in, in, its, in its literal form, be fulfilled uh, on earth, even with the promised land being um, enjoyed by Israel. And uh, we see that as happening in the millennium with Christ on the throne in Jerusalem. Those who practice replacement oh, theology might use verse 28 as a, as a proof text. I don't think it's correct application, but uh, they might do that. Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. Yeah, um, people use that same verse to say that there should be no distinctions between male and female roles in the church as well. But the point of the context of this verse 28 is um, that we all come to Christ in exactly the same way, by grace through faith. And that's the whole point he's making in this whole, well, the whole book. Um, anyway, uh, Pastor Plumley, uh, just just to uh, <clears throat> kind of chime in on on uh, Mel's question. Generally, what people that believe that um, Israel or the Church has replaced Israel will try to um, structure their argument um, under the equation of Israel equals the people of God equals the church. But the problem with that is that Israel always has a national character. The church does not have a national character. It's a, it's a false equation. <laughs> That's generally what they will try to do, uh, is equate Israel and the church as the people of God, which they are not the same. Right. Definitely. Yeah, I hate using this argument on many things, but I would say also for that significant amount of a doctrine of an issue, I, I believe there would have been some more focused teaching on that, either from Christ himself or the apostles to that effect. I mean, Christ was very specific on what the new covenant would be and, and many other things. And to say that what he was doing was replacing Israel, you know, with, with, the bride would be, you know, a, a, I would think that would be <clears throat> more something that would require some teaching than, than uh, you know, than not. And to, and, to, and to draw that up by some vague verses and trying to apply something for which they don't, I think is a little telling of how weak that type of argument really is. So actually, I'm going to stick up a little bit for them. Not, not, not that I believe in their theology, but I, I don't think that their, their theology is completely weak. There are several verses. Um, there's a Romans 2 verse, not all who are Jews or Jews inwardly, uh, are, are not all who are Jews outwardly or Jews inwardly. I, I forget exactly the way it reads, but, but um, it, it points out that that there's the difference between inward faith and an, and an outward association with the nationality. And then also there's a verse uh, where Jesus declares that, that, it, that the uh, it's in Matthew 20, hold on, where he says, basically he says that, that, that it'll be taken from them and given to, to uh, uh, the Gentiles. And I, I have to look and see what the reference, is. I don't have it all in front of me, but you know, I don't want to. I, I guess I'm, I'm sticking up for our, our brothers in the Ligonier Ministries a little bit, but uh, I don't think that it's the best way to read it. But I do understand where some of that thought process comes in. 
Um, I wouldn't call it weak, but it's certainly not as strong as the argument that the nation of Israel is a nation. Yeah, um, I think it's harder for them to deal with Romans 11. Um, where um, Paul is being very explicit about um, the future that God has for Israel. Um, read starting in verse 1, I, I say then God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Quoting here, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear not, down to this very day. David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not, and bend their backs forever. So then Paul continues, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited by fear, or but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Uh, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient 
that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that they may show mercy to all. And then he has a um, bit of a doxology there. So um, there is, he uses the word mystery here. There is a bit of a mystery as to what the relationship in God's economy is of Israel and the church. But um, it, it seems clearer here in this passage that uh, he's still dealing with a distinct Israel and a distinct um, church. And that there's, there is a grafting going on. There's a combined uh, uh, extent to which um, all genuine believers, whether Jews or Gentiles, are brought into Christ, as the Galatian passage said. Um, but uh, there's a distinction here. It's not every... It's not everybody from all places are coming to Christ and into one body. Well, that is true, but the mystery of it is that there's still this distinction between um, the wild and the cultivated. And um, uh, the fact that there is this remnant that who God has chosen from Israel, uh, from which all will be saved. So... Uh, a question about, uh, I think it was verse 28. I just didn't quite get it when he says, in this way, all Israel will be saved. All Israel who are chosen. He makes reference. Um, right before that. Well, I forget where he mentioned it. But um, it's referring to all Israel from among the nation of Israel, um, those who are chosen, those who are elect, uh, every one of them, even though they have not yet all uh, come to faith, um, they will. It doesn't mean every Jew um, alive at the time or over the course of time which means that the elect. Yeah. Alan, I have something to say that there's a difference between the covenant of um, the new covenant and still the nation of Israel. And that's spoken about in Isaiah and Jeremiah. He said, you'll make a new covenant with Israel and they will need to be taught the Bible because they'll have the spirit within them. But then he also says, the beginning in I am Jeremiah 31, about verse 33. And this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. And here's the distinction. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for the light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth stretched out below, then I will cast off the offspring of Israel for all they have done, declares the Lord. So he's saying there, there'll be a nation forever. Yep, it could not be clear, could it? There are a number of prophecies like that in the Old Testament. They're very clear about the future. Um, like Ezekiel has some. Um, very clear. Um, now, for what it's worth, if, if you 
maintain the presumption, I'm calling it a presumption rather than a, a uh, teaching from scripture, but it, the presumption that the church has replaced Israel, then you're very naturally led to view things like baptism as a replacement for circumcision, which is one of the reasons, rationales for infant baptism. Um, not just as a replacement for circumcision, but the whole idea of being identified with um, the elect from childhood as part of the covenant, coming under the covenant. Um, um, your your uh, view of end times prophecies um, uh, is... is very much affected by um, your, your approach to this question. And so when we take the prophecies about the millennium and so on, literally as a thousand years, they would tend to spiritualize it and um, uh, not be as, as um, insistent on holding to the, the uh, specific details. Alan, um, yes, so, yes, so um, well, one of the other things that sticks out to me is that when you go to Revelation, I know that um, I think Sean brought Revelation into the, the conversation earlier, but Revelation 21, 12, when he begins to talk about the, um, the holy city of Jerusalem, first of all, we'll just start there, that's what it's called, um, and then also the city had, um, it had a great high wall and then it goes, he goes later to tell you how big and how wide that wall is. It has 12 gates and each of those gates is a name of a tribe of Israel upon it. So those gates were named for every, every one of the 12 tribes of uh, the sons of Israel. And then he goes on to say that, um, he says, um, let's see, it had a great, in high wall with 12 gates and the gates were uh, and at the gates 12 angels and names were written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of israel then down on verse 14 it says and this is the distinction between israel and um the church he says at verse 14 and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the lamb so they are positionally different, even in the, the holy city. The, the remnant, the, um, the uh, Jews, Israel itself is, has been given a distinction at the gate, at each of the gates, which, um, and having such a great wall in 12, foundation stones they're still foundation stones but the predominant message here i believe is that um the gates are more prominent that's an entry point yeah um, um it's very clear that god in his um plan for salvation plan for his people and his kingdom uh takes into account both Israel and the church. Um, from our perspective, it's easy to see the distinction. I'm guessing that someone who is convinced that the church has replaced Israel would view passages like this as giving recognition of the, the heritage that we have um, uh, coming from Israel and um, um, it's probably easy for them to rationalize away in their own mind the significance of some of the symbolism, particularly if they're not taking the details of Revelation literally anyway. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. I think that the bigger problem is, is I mean, somebody who believes and thinks that way um, has a bigger issue with interpretation of the Bible, mm -hmm. because yes. I think 
the foundation here is that we need to allow the Bible to interpret itself. Yes, that is key. That is key. Um, and it ought to be a lesson to us because it's so easy for us to go into the scriptures and have our own sort of framework or uh, preconceived notions, assumptions, some of which are probably absolutely correct. Others may be less um, defensible from scripture, but we, we start from there and we interpret scripture in light of those things as if they were true and thereby end up twisting what scripture is really saying because we're forcing it to conform to our preconceived ideas. It's easy to point fingers at other people who would do that, but I got to tell you, we can all be subject to doing that and we need to be careful. Uh, we do need to let scripture interpret scripture, uh, not to impose our, our preconceived ideas. Um, that's, uh, of course, what's called um, um, eisegesis, where we, we um, read into the scriptures things that are not there, but they're in our thinking. Uh, exegesis mm -hmm. takes out of scripture what is already there and puts the pieces together based on what scripture actually says. Um, we need to be careful not to read into scripture, but we do this all the time with other relationships. We read into what people say to us because we're assuming something about their motives and we're probably not completely correct about their motives. And so we can't read into what they said or what they did. We need to talk with them directly to make sure we're understanding what they are saying, what they are meaning. Um, so it ought to be a warning anyway to all of us, particularly in our interpretation of scripture. So. To, to go with this eisegesis thing though, um, a, a little bit further, and this is where maybe I go back a little bit to my idea of the, of the, about having a more strong position about the teaching of the separation or teaching that the church has replaced Israel and stuff like that is that when you go to Romans chapter two and in verse nine, it says there will be tribulation distress for every soul of a man who does evil to the Jew first and also to the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so when we go into some of these verses and stuff like that, you know, in, in trying to make some of these stretches, you know, especially for saying that church has replaced Israel or something like that, you could go into this verse and say, well, if you're not Jewish and you're not Greek, then, you know, this verse, th these verses don't even apply here as well. So I think we need to go into, you know, some of the intent of some of this to the exegesis rather than the eisegesis, because we can take any of these, any verse we want, really, and apply some sort of stretch of logic to make it apply to whatever we want. That's a basis of a a lot of the false teaching that we have today is that, right. you know, well, two things, you have to, you have to spiritualize something or give some sort of loose interpretation and exercise tolerance for some other po person's point of view. And that's not how we interpret God's scripture, you know, in, in that light. So I think, I think we really need to be careful, but, you know, here we could say the rest of the world is just out of luck because we're not Jewish and we're not Greek. You know, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, we, we've got to, we've got to be reasonable and rational in this. Yeah. Um, a couple other thoughts here. Uh, other passage that to me at least very strong uh, implications. And that's the prophecy in Daniel nine that speaks of the last days where it uh, says that there would be um, 70 weeks, God says, are decreed for your people. Um, he's speaking to Daniel, and when he says to Daniel, 70 weeks are decreed for your people, who are his people? The Jews, right? And Daniel just got done praying for the return of Israel to uh, Jerusalem and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. 
And part of the answer to that was God's revealing his long-term plan for Israel. And so 70 weeks are decreed for you, and he breaks it up between 69 weeks and a 70th week. Um, and he's not particularly um, at all clear in Daniel 9, but we know in hindsight that there's a long time between the 69th week and the 70th week. And there's more detail given about that 70th week elsewhere in the prophecies in the Old Testament, but fleshed out particularly in Revelation. Um, and um, um, apart from the fact that the, the, the time between the 69th week when the Messiah would be cut off, it says in Daniel 9, and the beginning of the, seven, the 70th week is a long period of time, which we now understand to be the church age. Um, the 70th week is still part of the 70 weeks that are decreed for your people, Daniel, Israel. That 70th week, God is going to culminate his activity for and to the nation of Israel as the tribulation. Um, and that's, again, also consistent with our understanding from the rapture and so on, that the church will not be going through that tribulation period. But God's going to be separating out his elect during the tribulation from the nation of Israel. Um, and uh, it'd be hard to explain that, 16, that, that 70th week, which has not yet happened, uh, to be focusing on the nation of Israel, Daniel's people, if God still didn't have a plan, a future for the nation of Israel. Um, but that leads me to another um, observation that these things are not just theoretical. Um, they actually have very tangible uh, implications in real life. And I mentioned the, the belief about infant baptism, but perhaps more tragically, um, one of the rationales of the German church in the 30s um, to accommodate themselves to Hitler's um, extermination of the Jews was that this must be God's judgment because God has given up on the Jews. He has replaced them with Israel. Replacement theology allowed them to accommodate themselves to Hitler's atrocity. And that's well documented. Um, has implications. You know, if, if we misunderstand what scripture is saying, then we can come to very tragic conclusions. Um, so that ought to be a, a lesson, I guess, for all of us. And I think we, we um, talked a lot about the, the interpretation, the, eschat the eschatological differences, because that's where I think uh, you really, really see a distinction between the two viewpoints. Um, but then I, I think I would kind of also say to that is that how you view eschatology, I think a lot of people kind of dismiss it, but it, it's incredibly important. Uh, your, the way you see your eschatology, the, the idea of the rapture, the, you know, these things that uh, it really affects or should affect, if it doesn't affect it, maybe that's an issue too, but it should affect your worship of the Lord and, and your, your walk with the Lord. Uh, so it's not a little thing that there's differences, um, you know, but, uh, you know, that, that viewpoint of your eschatology really changes if, if you don't, like you said, focus on the most literal, let the Bible interpret itself, like Eric had mentioned as well. Um, it, all of those things are really affected by your viewpoint on this. Right. Yeah, and we're going to uh, 
pick up on that when we get to section 10 on last things and times, eschatology. Um, so we'll come back to that, but that's very true. Um, well, I wanted to touch on a couple of other subjects as well, if we've got a little time here. So on uh, page 213, kind of completely changing, not completely, but significantly changing uh, gears here. The, the third application question asks, who does the work of the ministry? What implications does that have for you? So, how would we answer that? It sounds like everyone does. Every it sounds, person. What sounds like everyone does? The work, the ministry belongs to each one of us. Where do we see that in scripture? Well, I'm thinking what? that we all have spiritual gifts and what other purpose would it have but to be serving and help edifying the body? Definitely. By yeah. ministry, they mean helping out in that way. Yeah, that's why we're gifted to do that. Yep. Um, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure in this, of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Exactly. So um, the, the point there is that the, the members of the body are being equipped for the work of service, right? The ministry of the church. Um, we are sometimes too comfortable with the traditional concept that the church ministry is led by a minister and the ministers are the ones who minister. <laughs> Um, but we're all ministers, biblically, right? God has called us to, uh, as Amy said, use our spiritual gifts to minister um, as he has designed the body to function. Every member of the body, of our physical bodies, has a role so that the, the body can uh, do what it's supposed to do, and likewise, our spiritual body, the church, uh, is made up of many members, each with uh, a role, each with um, a supernatural gifting, and in, in many cases, roles to um, advance the ministry. So, the more important question, perhaps, is what implications does that have for you? You need to find out what your role is, what your spiritual gift is, in order to help the body. So we need to find out what it is. And then as you wrapped up there, once we find out what it is, we need to be good stewards of that gift. And exercise role. it. Yeah. Exercise the role. Exercise it. Yeah. It, it. it also also means we're not done until we're done right <laughs> we're not done until we go to see jesus we have to keep tarrying until that day <laughs> yep pastor yep. i would say that um we shouldn't just wait until we discover what our spiritual gifts are because some people are still trying to figure that out and then if they keep waiting, they're doing nothing. So we need to get involved and hopefully through being involved, we can start to discern what those gifts are. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yep. Now, often uh, being involved in ministry gives us um, confirmation as to how God has gifted us. But even if we're involved in a ministry where we're not gifted, uh, we're still um, a part of the body, helping the body to function. 
and um, it's that's all good. Yep. No, to that point, one uh, wise pastor, college professor, said a long time ago when I was looking for direction, he said, "You got to make a move." He said, "You can't steer a parked car." Right. And that to that end is, you know, we we find our our gift and we we um uh we find that strength to minister as we're going about doing the work, not waiting for somebody to bestow it upon us. Definitely. I think too, there's a little bit of an admonition here to uh, realize that we need to mature. There is a maturing factor for enabling us or maybe making us more effective in administering to the body. Yes, the fact that someone is gifted in a particular area doesn't mean that they start out as an expert in that area. Um, we all need to grow in our um, uh, understanding of and effectiveness in using our spiritual gift to be good stewards. Um, but the, good, the, the proper exercising of those gifts helps to bring about a lot of that maturing, uh, both in us and in those we're ministering alongside definitely but that also doesn't mean that we minister only according to that gift to the exclusion of any other thing definitely. i think some people focus on that well my gift is my gift is mercy and forget the other things as far as teaching or anything else it, it, that doesn't preclude any of that other effort it, it just means that may be where our strength is but it, it doesn't confine our ministry only there yeah, I don't know if I mentioned it in this class, everything's a blur here, but um, one of my observations is that pretty much all of the spiritual gifts that are currently active in the church are addressing areas that uh, either all or many of us are commanded to do anyway. Right? So there's a gift of evangelism. We can't say, oh, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I'll let someone else do that for me. Right? We all have the responsibility to evangelize. Likewise, there's a gift of mercy. Well, we're all commanded to be merciful and to show mercy. Um, there's a gift of giving. Can I say, I don't need to give because I don't have the gift of giving? No, pretty much every, uh, even teaching, um, um, there are specific commands like teaching within the home and, and so on, where, where um, it, it should be more broadly um, uh, practiced. But, um, um, so what is the purpose of the spiritual gift if we're all commanded in most or all of these things anyway well, the person who has the gift um, uh, can provide an example of how to exercise that, how to be faithful in that area. Uh, they can help to train the rest of us in those areas. They can uh, kind of prod us, nudge us into uh, uh, getting outside of our comfort zone, perhaps, sometimes in order to be faithful in what we have been commanded to do. Lots of things that those with a gift can do to benefit the body so that the body grows in those very same areas until we all become a mature man, right? Um, so it's all connected. Okay. Uh, maybe we have time for a quick one. Um, How about on page 220, in the third interpretation question, how can you reconcile our responsibility in evangelism and God's role in evangelism? Uh, the context here is the realization that God is sovereign over salvation and uh, God needs to draw people to himself. Nobody's going to come to Christ 
on his own initiative. So how can we reconcile God's responsibility and our responsibility? So um, it's actually a, a subject that I, I love to kind of discuss because to be honest with you, uh, understanding the role of our responsibilities greatly enhanced my desire to evangelize. Um, you know, the idea that, that uh, God in his tremendous grace and mercy and wisdom uh, gives us the opportunity to cooperate in his plan is, it's really quite, to me, it's really amazing. And so I, um, and also to know that if I preach the gospel, and it's a rejection of the gospel that there will be many who reject, th that's not on me, right? That's, that's really not on me. Um, I was faithful to proclaim. I was faithful to, to speak. But at the end of the day, God has to open the hearts. And, and um, you know, I, I'll just give you a, a quick example. And, and, and it won't be me. It'll be Eric. And, and um, we were speaking to a friend of ours uh, about, uh, about Christ. And, we, we had been kind of praying about how we we're going to approach him and, and to be honest, kind of maybe tiptoeing around it. And so one day Erica just went and just went right at her <laughs> and just, I mean, just flat out, look, you need to repent and you're, you're an enemy of God. And, and until you do that, then you're not going to understand any of this. But the first thing you need to understand is this is your position and this is what's going to happen to you if you don't accept and I was just like, wow. And then we got done and I was like, that's pretty harsh, Eric. And you came right at her. And she's like, well, it's up to God now. <laughs> and that's really kind of true. You know, it gives us that courage to speak out. So I'm sorry. It's just, that's a particular subject for me that I, I, I love to talk about. So sorry to jump in like that, but. No, good. Any other? Um... There is another, there is another, uh question there too because it says you know it's not god's desire that it's god's desire that everybody be saved and yet what's our so it should be easy for us to evangelize to be able to speak because it's god's desire that they come to him and yet his sovereignty gets involved in that too and i have you know i have a struggle with that sometimes yeah it's hard for us to comprehend um the relationship between the sovereignty of God in really any context and places that people have. People have struggled with that, of course, for, for eons. Um, but it ought to comfort us to know that evangelism would be impossible completely if God didn't draw people to himself. Right? No one uh, who is dead in their sins would respond to a proclamation of the gospel unless God did, in fact, draw people to himself. So that makes evangelism possible. Um, Alan, um, yep. also, I, I like um, that Mr. Byler reminded us that there were two two aspects to that question because um, uh, in Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20, when he talks about all authority has been given to me in heaven on earth, this is Jesus, God speaking to us, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all, um, observe all that I commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is God <clears throat> saying, here's my role. I have the authority, but I'm also commanding you in your role to go therefore and preach to the nation. Yeah, so we have the privilege to participate in what ultimately only God can do. Why do you suppose he did it that way? <laughs> I would say ultimately for his own glory because um, it would be one thing you know we always make that joke about just when we baptize people just you know hold them under and send them on to heaven 
but I mean, realistically, it brings God a lot more glory to redeem us and then show through his redemption of us, the change in us. And then that we go out and we bring others toward or help to bring others toward Christ and into redemption, it ultimately glorifies God. Yeah, I, I believe so too. I believe that it, it's most glorifying to God to draw people to himself in, in their heart um, through the cooperation and, and uh, involvement of redeemed sinners such as us. It just puts on display God's grace and, and that glorifies him. And then in some ways, doesn't it also benefit us in that we're storing up our riches in heaven rather than on earth? Yeah, it gives us a great blessing, uh, both now and in eternity, to be um, having an impact on eternity. But uh, it gives us great joy even now to participate in that process, doesn't it? It also no, takes think... us off the hook somewhat, because we, we go ahead and, and do what we're supposed to do in, uh, in bringing the evangelistic discussion to someone, and if they, you know, shut us off and don't pay any attention, we say, well, that's not my responsibility. I've done what I've, I've done. I've done what I'm supposed to do, and it's up to God now. Yeah, of course, it is our responsibility to to um, communicate in ways that are um, appropriate and not offensive, so that we're not the cause of stumbling, but the gospel itself is the cause of any. Oh yeah, that would happen. Yeah, but I, I think you know we all understand that. Anyway, let me close in prayer. This is a good discussion, um, and. We'll um, next week pick up again with um, the next section, which is on angels, and uh, continue at that point. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning that you've given us to interact together, to encourage one another by your word, and to help us um, understand it and apply it well. Uh, we pray that uh, you would... Uh, bear fruit as a result of this, and that uh, as we go now to worship you corporately, that you would be pleased with our hearts, and you would be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, take care, you all. See you next week. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Have a good week. Thank you. You too.